Welcome to Nostalgia, your favorite pop culture podcast where we have deep conversations about superficial things. I'm Nicole, your host, and each week we unlock core memories from the 90s, 2000s, and beyond while examining the past through a contemporary lens. Our guests are pop culture tastemakers who explore how our formative experiences shape how we see the world. We talk about trends, fashion, music, identity, consumer behavior, societal attitudes, and more. Nostalgia is a reminder of how our individual and collective memories make us feel like we belong and if you like nostalgia be sure to follow subscribe rate review and share with a friend who loves pop culture as much as we do plus we have a lot of fun enjoy the show Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nostalgia. I'm super excited because I have not one, but two guests with me today. They are both from the No More Late Fees podcast, Danielle and Jackie. Super excited to have them. They were former Blockbuster employees, which is so cool. I can't wait to ask them about what that experience was like. And we're going to talk about all of the movies and the pop culture that brought them together and has sustained their very long friendship, which we love. So welcome, guys. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much. We're so happy to be here. I'm very excited that you guys are here with me. So, okay, very important. You guys both worked at Blockbuster. Did you meet there when you were both employees? Um, no. (laughs) We actually... (laughs) (laughs) We actually met in high school, um, and Jackie was the first to get a job at Blockbuster, and then um, I couldn't get a job at the Blockbuster she worked at. They were fully staffed, so I ended up working at a different Blockbuster, but I worked my way to my darling here, Um, and then she ended up being my boss, and I'm sorry, because (laughs) (laughs) I am not a customer service person. When people are rude, I'm rude back. So she had her work cut out for her at Blockbuster. It's true. Uh, I decided, my parents never pressured me to get a job, but I decided senior year in high school, because you had to be 17 to work at Blockbuster, because you had to rent the, the, the movies that you were renting to other people. And I was like, I'm going to apply for one job, and it's at Blockbuster, and if I don't get it, I'm not getting a job because (laughs) I have hard opinions on random things. And so I went. I nailed the interview. I started working there. I loved it. I ended up working there for seven and a half years. Um, Got Danielle to apply, a couple of other friends. My sister uh, ended up applying and working at Blockbuster where she met her now husband. So... We are very much a Blockbuster family. (laughs) Oh my God, a Blockbuster love story. Yes. Wow. (laughs) And it's also kind of how Jackie met her husband, too, in a weird way. Uh, He was um, a friend of my boss's girlfriend's, if you can connect those dots. But I did, it was six degrees of Blockbuster is how I met my husband. And when... I I was living in New York when I came home. Jackie came to pick me up from my house with her new boyfriend. And it turned out that he was my neighbor growing up, my next door neighbor. So as he's pulling up to the house, he's like, I used to live there. And I was like, when he got to the door, I was like, I know him. He used to live there. (laughs) So it is very spooky how all that happened. (laughs) Wow. That is so funny. And... There's really nothing like Blockbuster to bring people together. <laughs> it's know. really, truly a bonding experience. Um, I I absolutely love it. I still have random nightmares that, like, I get called <laughs> in to work at Blockbuster and I can't remember, like, all of the POS keys and stuff. Um, and there's a super long line because it's Friday night. Um, but other than that, nothing but good memories. <laughs> That's so funny. You know how they always say that people have dreams from certain traumatic experiences in their life. And most people have dreams about school. And I'm like, well, 
doesn't resonate. I, I have dreams about dance recitals. And so you have dreams about blockbuster yep. shifts. It's like, it all makes sense. I do not dream of blockbusters. I <laughs> Yeah, it was a really good time. Uh, I mean, it, it it it's funny because we watched the um the last, last blockbuster, blockbuster documentary mm-hmm. during COVID, um the beginning of the pandemic. And I mean, I didn't think I was that nostalgic for Blockbuster, but like both of us ended up crying watching it mm-hmm. and It is just something that you'll never get back now. Like, I don't forget that this was, like, some huge conglomerate and it killed a bunch of mom-and-pop video stores. Um, So I don't romanticize it in that way. But for us, just the coworkers that we got to hang out with, the experiences that, like, the, the way that we loved movies was rewarded and not, like, you know made fun of or you watch too much tv which i got a lot from my mom (laughs) growing up it was just this cool thing that both of us had um we could look at movie covers never seen the movie but know exactly what the movie is called just like weird things that we share (laughs) what years did you guys work there and did you see a shift in your experience as an employee from the beginning to the end because I've worked in retail and in fashion and to be with a company during a period of exponential growth is exciting but I've also been kind of on the other side of it where it's kind of like a what goes up must come down Mm. you go first because you had more (laughs) okay so yes I was there September 99 to March 2007 um and I was there for the shift from midnight returns to noon returns, so you got an extra half a day. Um, and then I was there from the shift of uh, no more late fees, where we get our title uh, of our podcast, where we kind of went to what they call restocking fees. And it was during that meeting while it was explained to us, and I'm like, this is the beginning of the end. Like, I just knew. I'm like, this is not sustainable. We're not going to get product back. Like, it's just not a great business model to, to pivot to. And I was 20, 21 thinking this. Like, so if I could see it, like, why are these executives not seeing it? Uh, we were there for the transition where they tried Blockbuster online and they were having us push that really hard. Yeah. Um, all of the, the, in-store passes, movie pass, um, game pass, where it was like you pay a set fee and you could check one movie or one game out at a time as many times as you wanted throughout the month. And then finally, when I decided to leave, um, that was when stores were beginning to close, we're getting less product, um, like just there was definitely like even a, a, a shift in like attitude towards Blockbuster, which was really, really sad because like we had our regulars that we had been interacting with for years and um, to kind of have to step away from that was was a big change for me because I had spent a good majority of uh, my college and post-college life at Blockbuster. It, it was my cornerstone, so. Yeah. Did you guys ever have to pay late fees yourself? Was there like that one movie where you're like, ah, it was usually, so we got five free rentals a week and, um, usually any late fees that I occurred was my family's fault. Like if I got my brother and sister or my mom, something they would forget. Like if I said, okay, you can have this, but you have to like bring it back that's usually when I would get a late fee. Um, I think more of the late fees that I uh, got was after, like when I wasn't working continuously at Blockbuster. It was like my family was probably using my card or something and and I'd come back home and there'd be late fees. I'd be pretty pissed about it. They put you on a do not rehire list. They're like, "This, this girl has too many outstanding late movies. She is not allowed back on the premises. No, not at all. Jackie always welcomed me back. I would come. So I worked, um, I think, from like 2000 to 2005. 
um, because I worked during my summers from school, so when I would come home. Um, But yeah, I never had a problem (laughs) getting there. (laughs) And when your best friend's the manager after that point, it's not really hard, so. That's great. (laughs) So were there any movies that you remember during your time at Blockbuster where people were excited for it to arrive in the store. And I don't remember exactly what kind of that time frame looked like of how mm-hmm. long after a movie came out would it be able to be rented at Blockbuster, but was there a time where people were like banging down the door to get to a certain movie? Yeah. Um like pretty much it's like any of the Blockbusters that you would see at the movie theater is this it would be the same thing. But relatively there would only be a few times throughout the year where it'd be kind of like a dip where the only new release we had was kind of a dud. Mm -hmm. Um, But, like, when Spider-Man came out, the Harry Potter series when that came out, and Jackie was there when the Mummy movies came out. She missed this, but she was there when they were transitioning from VHS to DVD. That was a nightmare. I'm glad I missed that. Wow. Yeah. Uh, For me... The, the one standout, so how it worked was movies left the theater, then um, were kind of like in purgatory for a little while, then went into a rental period, and then um, you could buy them. Mm. And so there were constantly people, when is this movie coming out? When is that movie coming out? So I ended up going and buying a whiteboard, and I would maintain a list of like upcoming movie releases on the whiteboard, so it just because it was every other person and you're having to like look it up in the system and stuff. It was just an easier way of doing it. And then, um, when American beauty came out, so we have to put our, or we worked for a corporate store. So they put in their orders for how many copies we were getting way in advance. And when American beauty came out, they put in an order for, I think like 29 copies. Well, that was prior to it winning best picture. So once it was nominated for Best Picture, they held the release date back. So we, it wins Best Picture, and we release it the next Tuesday with only 29 copies, and people were livid because you could not get it. It was always checked out, and I'm like, y'all, this is not a great movie anyway, so you're not. (laughs) (laughs) Don't believe the hype, but that was the one I remember where we just got so little inventory. And we worked in Boca, which is a different clientele. It's mostly older. Um, And so that type of movie was right up their alley anyway. And it was just like, just getting yelled at daily for weeks that we never had this movie in stock. I would say the, like, when Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon came out, I will tell the story to the day I die because <laughs> I have never in my life been cursed out, um, offered side hustle jobs to um, come put in DVD players for because again we had an older clientele. Um, I was like, yeah, that's I'm not coming to your house to set up your DVD. I'm sorry. But when Crouching Tiger came out, it wasn't dubbed originally. It was just the captions. So I would have people, I had a man literally throw a DVD at me. Like, I I think he was trying to slide it across the countertop, but it legit hit me. It took everything in me not to like punch him in the face. And he was like, what's all these words on the screen? I'm like, sir, this movie is not from America. It's in a different language. It's called captions like what it says it on the box like they were mad that was that was a really hard (laughs) yeah hard time in our poster (laughs) career was this stupid subtitled crouching tiger hidden dragon now looking back at it i realized that that was such a huge movie and a turning point kind of now it's so normalized where on Netflix you have a ton out of South Korea and out mm-hmm. of Spain and people all over the world watch these various movies or television shows, whatever. And now maybe it's just cause I can't hear as well. I don't know, but it's like, <laughs> I watch everything, even in English with Same. closed captioning. <laughs> I can't watch anything. And now especially with newer things like on Netflix, 
whoever writes those subtitles excellent job they will yeah. put the most like if you watch stranger things they'll put instead of like you know creepy noise or like noise in background it'll be like squelching noise and yeah. it's like <laughs> i somehow know exactly what you're talking about right now <laughs> and it gets so descriptive and i'm like that's really cool i am not team dubbing i think that number one it's just lesser of a enjoyable viewing experience mm -hmm. but i yeah. think too if it's in a language where i understand it's so much more useful to hear the original word and the context that it belonged in and then yeah. when you hear the english you're like oh that's that's very interesting they decided to choose that word to or they chose that translation to represent whatever the original idea or intention was behind it but even as you mentioned the transition too from VHS to DVD, I'm like, whoa, I literally forgot about that. And nowadays, I mean, it's kind of funny. So my Grammy, she doesn't have Wi-Fi. And recently she said to me and my sister, you're telling me everybody has Wi-Fi. And we're like, yes. She's like, everybody <laughs> like on the, on my street, yes. Like, just everybody has it. And she's like, Wi-Fi, I don't even know how to work the VCR player. And I'm like, don't worry, nobody under 25 knows either. <laughs> and so it's like, the fact that we've just completely phased out even a piece of technology from our own lifetime, it's pretty fascinating. I think it's so interesting. We... And it, it, we had that transition, and then we also had the transition from the three-fourths format to more of a widescreen format. So that was another time that people yeah. would get very upset. And I finally found a, a, a screen cap of The Mummy, and it was like showing that in the widescreen version, there were three characters. In the, the full-frame format... One of those characters you can't even see, like they crop them out of the screen. And it wasn't until I found that visual, people were just like, my TV's broken. I got these black bars on the top and the bottom. And we're like, that's how you're supposed to watch it now. I don't know what else to tell you. You can't get rid of them. I don't know. <laughs> and now we're like seeing the format change a little bit again. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and that has to do with social, you know, we have YouTube is a certain size and now Instagram has moved to, and TikTok more of, um, vertical, format. vertical versus yeah. horizontal. So it's just like watching all of this technology change. Yeah. And we were also at Blockbuster at the time that like the industry was trying to figure out if, where was the next step after like. DVD, right? Mm -hmm. So it was a competition. Uh, I think it was a competition between Blu-ray and what was HD. the other one? Was it the HD? Laser disc? No, it's HD DVD is what it was. Called. Yeah. And so we're like, everyone's trying to figure out which player they need to buy. Um, it, that was like a confusing thing. So it's just like, <sighs> it was very tiresome just... <laughs> constantly going through different technology during that time yeah and it with my first well first couple of paychecks i had to save up for it my very first big purchase after getting this job was a dvd player and <laughs> i was so excited and it died probably it's probably 10 years ago now uh but it lasted almost 20 years but i was so sad because it was like my first big grown-up purchase it was like 250 dollars <laughs> in 99 and i was so proud of that little dvd player uh but i think the best thing was the combo the vhs mm -hmm. tv combo um but it would piss me off because if the vhs player broke you know if one of the items one part of it broke you would be stuck right yeah that but like that was a time when they were making the they were making them pink and like personalized they don't do that anymore like it's i miss that those tvs were so cute <laughs> i know there's an instagram filter 
I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a little pink TV. And I'm yeah. like, that's cute. I kind of want that. I miss, I miss that. I miss our little Walkmans, all yeah. of that stuff. That was a, a really fun time in the early 2000s. The book of CDs 90s. you had to keep in your car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm getting nostalgic so much to the point where I also don't have my own car. So it's like I have no need for a not only a binder of cds but a binder of cds to put in a car seeing as i don't have the like even my macbook that i'm on now doesn't have the cd drive it's just it's not needed in my life in any way except for the fact that i just want to feel the feeling that you get holding a binder of cds like yes i just want that feeling again (laughs) I just remember like when AOL kept on sending you those CD-ROMs and then sometimes like magazines would even attach like a new game to test out or when Lost came out they had like the first few episodes on a CD-ROM and I was like oh this is so I'm so excited for this like those were the days physical oh, yeah. media I love that it's like kind of ha- you know really brewing again now we have such a great community on Instagram with the podcast and we have met so many physical media collectors and they have amazing collections and some movies we can't get streaming like when we're doing episodes we have to look to see if we can get it streaming we're really nervous for that one day where we're going to run up to a movie that it's not anywhere you know we have a couple on our schedule for next year where it's not streaming and so we're already now like every time I go to Goodwill I do a scan of the DVDs like is it here (laughs) can we get it I had to like go and buy a blu-ray player to like hook up to my front room tv when my roommate took his xbox because I'm like how do I watch things now on the big TV? <laughs> so it has been a, a challenge in some areas, just finding movies that we want to do for the podcast. Yeah, that reminds me of a few things. First of all, I always say that the devil works hard, but the people who worked in direct marketing or direct <laughs> mail for AOL in the late 90s worked harder because those CD-ROMs were everywhere in yeah. our lives. Yeah. Second of all, Spice World is not streaming anywhere, which would be a huge issue. But seeing as I have the 10 year anniversary edition (laughs) of the DVD, um, I can still watch it as regularly as I need to. And I want to know what you guys think, too, because we had a different perception when streaming first came onto the scene. How it was positioned toward us as consumers was like, it's the internet. You don't have to have all these DVD cases in your house anymore. We have an infinite amount of, well, we didn't call it content back then. You have an infinite amount of movies that you could watch. But now it's gotten trickier, especially as every single company is coming out with their own streaming service. For example, even five years ago when... I could watch HBO shows on Amazon Prime. Now there's HBO Max. They're pulling all of that stuff off and putting it on their own platform. So not only, I actually heard, I have no idea where, but I heard that now our streaming options are actually more limited than the access and availability that we had in a blockbuster store because it's only the perception of an infinite selection when Mm -hmm. in reality when money and licensing and all of the legalities behind this digital access come into play we don't have as much choice or ease as we thought we would yeah i I mean, honestly, because history repeats itself, we probably should have saw the streaming wars coming um, because we saw it when cable first came out and how they were undercutting each other. Um, the, the, the business aspect behind a, a lot of why some of our favorite movies aren't streaming, ha- there's a lot of that to do with it. It has to do with the fact that if you really think about it, when people signed those deals years ago to have music on their shows, it was with the idea of syndication, not necessarily this streaming model, right? Um, even if when you look at actors and being able to get their residual checks, um, royalty checks, 
it's not happening in the same way. And, you know, you're even seeing newer actors who are not going to get the same kind of money that the people in syndication did back in the day. So all of that's very interesting. Um, and they did have this whole thing where they kind of pushed us to get rid of our physical media. And Jackie and I had very extensive collections. Mm -hmm. And for me, I moved so many times. I was just like, okay, maybe it's just time to let it go. I highly regret that. I had some pieces of media that I, they don't sell anymore or they're really extremely hard. Like we both had 200 cigarettes and we both got rid of them. Mm -hmm. And we were freaking out when we had to do the movie. And then we realized they were like selling on eBay for like $200, $300. Um, luckily, just as we did the episode, they re-released it on DVD. And we were able to order. We just I just bought Jackie and I a copy because we're like, we're not getting stuck again. And like, I, I, you know, the convenience of streaming is great, but I miss all the cool fun nuggets and extras that we used to get on dvds and just like you know some of the content that i'll put on our instagram pages just like trying to find those screenshots of the dvd menus because they were so fun and they added like an extra layer about the movie wasn't it like an, a complete experience it wasn't just like you watched it one and done kind of how we feel about these netflix movies that come out but like you knew you were gonna rewatch them over and over again, and mm -hmm. every time you got a new experience, there's commentary. Like the actors would sit with the director and tell you all these really cool things about the movies. That so each time was just different, and we don't get that anymore. Like, I mean, now we have like a bunch of interviews and we have TikTok and stuff like that, but it's just not the same. Like, mm -hmm. it sucks. Yeah. What was an episode of your podcast that you've done? Um, our 13 Ghosts episode. I just, it was the feeling I got doing it. It was so much fun. It was fun talking to Danielle, who does not like horror movies, about this movie. It had Matthew Lillard in it, which is already a home run for us. And the guest we had was great. It was just one of those things where I can't, put my finger on exactly why I love that episode. It was just from top to bottom, so much fun to record. The other one was the mummy. Um, our guest was Lindley key. She was the one who, um, had the one-on-one -on -one with Brendan Fraser and told him, we're all rooting for you. We're all so happy that you're back. And he started tearing up. She did the mummy with us and it was so much fun. She was so knowledgeable and so gracious. And it was just a really, really, well executed episode in my opinion like we had all the facts in there the the banter the rapport it was all there plus it's the mummy and what's not to love about the mummy <laughs> yeah <laughs> that that was a really good episode um when we did our end of the year show i said our my favorite episode last year was um independence day we have a lot of guests on our show and we love our guests. We have a really good time. Um, but it was one of those episodes where it was just me and Jackie and it was kind of like the core of our friendship of us just laughing and finding the silliest things hilarious. Um, and the stress of it, because that was the first time we tried recording on a different platform and we damn near lost the episode and our sound, like things were just so stressful with that one episode but we laughed so hard doing that episode so that's definitely one of my favorites um and then this season what i love is that i feel like we've grown so much so like it's not just the movies but the experience of like the growth of our confidence in doing the episodes and um we've really kind of found how the rhythm of our show episode should be. Um, and we've just had really, really talented guests this season that we've had a lot of guests, like Jackie said with Lindley, had so much knowledge about the movies that we're doing with them. So that's always really fun too. Like we put some notes and facts together, but when they come with like a passion and they know a lot, that's just been fun. Um, so we've had a lot of that. We did bend them like Beckham this year, and we had an amazing guest. Yeah, the, because she came from that cultural background, she was able to 
kind of give us insight into like, yeah, that's how it really is. And, and elaborate on a lot of things. It, it was a really, really interesting conversation. I really do like those episodes where kind of, it's not my wheelhouse. It's not my episode to steer. Cause I do a lot of the steering. Um, but when we get in, like when we did Eve's Bayou and it was from a black experience and our guest and Danielle were both, um, had that experience and were able to elaborate on things. And I just got to sit and listen and learn. And those are the episodes that I really value too, is just where I can have personal growth and under, come to understanding of um, someone else's perspective on things. Yeah. Those, those episodes have been really fun. <laughs> Yeah, we were chatting a little bit earlier when I was talking to you guys just about the nostalgia POV where it's not necessarily about the movie that we're talking about. It's more so how that piece of culture impacted us and helped shape our identity and how we're able to move through the world as people. And like you're saying as well, with whether it's a broadened cultural perspective or just a understanding of someone friendship one of my very favorite <laughs> themes ever and even just seeing how you guys have had a friendship for years and years and how working at blockbuster was something that you both can share and your passion for movies and for culture is shared um i want to ask a few kind of rapid fire questions so sure. the first one Okay, just for a little context first, because I'm actually really bad at doing rapid fire. But anyway, <laughs> so my favorite kind of movie is, and I suppose that you could just call this a teen coming of age film or a teen rom-com kind of thing. But I get the greatest comfort from Gen X ensemble casts mm. because it's like there are so many people even as you mentioned Matthew Lillard before, it's like, okay, you know this movie's going to be good because you recognize at least like five people in it and they're of varying degrees of fame. And so there are just enough people where it's familiar to you who you recognize. But then wherever there's unfamiliarity, you have curiosity because you're like, I know that person from somewhere. I know them. And then, of course, if you're like me, you have to go on Wikipedia or... um IMDb, IMDb and look yep. them up and figure out, oh, she was Chandler's um, ex-girlfriend on Friends. Or like, yep. oh, I remember they were in an episode of whatever TV show. That game is extremely fun to play for me. Now that we have some context on what Gen X ensemble casts are, what movie featuring a Gen X ensemble cast is your favorite Okay, you say one, and I'll say the other one, because okay. I, I already know which ones they are. You go first. Scream. No, that's, no, that's not. <laughs> I thought, okay, I'm just going to say the ones I thought we were going to say, which was Empire Records and 200 Cigarettes. Yeah. For sure. Best ensemble cast. <laughs> That's Sorry, great. I went rogue. <laughs> Wait, you, you guys did. aren't reading each other's minds yet? Yeah. <laughs> uh, we should. I don't know where Scream came well, from. Well, my You thought was, of Matthew Lillard. That's yeah, why. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's spooky mine season. Were, mine were Scream and 10 Things I Hate About You. But are those Gen X or those Mullen? Oh, I guess I the don't... actors may. I don't know. I find... Heath Ledger was definitely Gen X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess so. I and know what Scream is. was. It's, they the actors themselves yes yeah. i guess it's because those movies came out in our like time millennial yeah. time period i guess cuz anything 94 and le and younger is what i think of the gen x people yeah mhm mm i always remember even if they were playing people a little bit younger when they'd have somehow every movie was like the class of 99 yeah I'm like, oh, wow that would be so cool to like be in high school and graduate <laughs> you know right before the new millennium and it's like oh, wow can't hardly wait it's probably another yeah. good one too they mm -hmm. that that's a definite like catch all these people yeah um and, and just we we did that uh, as one of our earlier episodes and we're just like Everyone's now lonely. all of these people have like full-fledged long careers 
And, uh, like, you're just like, Peter Fascinelli, like, he was Carlisle in Twilight. Like, <laughs> it, they went on to, like, really big roles. And it was fun to be like, oh, yeah, that's that person. Like, you were saying IMDb. Even if you didn't know their name, you're like, I've seen that person in a ton of stuff. Yeah. yeah I say that about Eric Balfour because he was in Can't mm -hmm. Hardly Wait. Yes. He was in Six Feet Under. He was in The O.C. and Clea Duvall. Like anything yes. that has either of them in it, I'm like, I'm in. Sign and me up. I think a lot of people forget that Eric Balfour was in the first season, first episode of Buffy. And I remember right. watching that show thinking, oh, he's in it because he was he's one of those actors from the 90s that was in it was on a ton of TV shows, but they kept getting canceled. So you just knew him, but like, did, you know, there wasn't like one long standing thing that he was on. And so when I watched the first episode of Buffy, I was like, oh, he's gonna, he was more recognizable than all the other people. So I was like, oh, he's gonna be a part of the cast. And he died. I was right. like, oh, guess I was wrong. There's another connection. Um, Seth Green in Can't Hardly Wait and Buffy. Yeah. Yes. Which so I love. is so is um the girl who played Tara on Buffy. She's also in Can't Hardly Wait. No. Yeah. She has like a black dress with a blue stripe on it. She's one of just like the guys, one of the girls that Kenny tries to hit hit on Seth Green. And yeah, so she's in that one too. Oh, that is so funny. Um okay, so my next question is who would you be if you were in Bring It On, what character would you be? Isis all day. I don't even think there's a question. I don't even have to think about it. I m most closely identified with Missy in that movie. Lots of Buffy crossover in Bring It On, too. Yes. Mm -hmm. There were the girl who plays... Glory. Glory. Um, obviously, Missy who plays Faith, mm -hmm. and the girl, Whit so Whitney and Courtney, mm -hmm. like the two mm -hmm. mean girls from Bring It On. And the girl who played Whitney had a smaller role in Buffy, but she was definitely in it too. There are definitely was, more people I'm forgetting. And she was also in Can't Hardly Wait as well, mm -hmm. the girl who played Whitney. Yep. That she was the crying loved, girl. Yeah. That's why yeah. I loved Can't Hardly Wait is because – there's just someone in every single scene. However, I feel like that is one movie where there are certain 90s tropes that you see. And on the show, we talk a lot about examining the past through a contemporary lens because it's like we do move with the understanding of like these things, these pieces of culture that are made are ultimately a product of their time. Mm -hmm. And that's just the cultural zeitgeist in which they were produced. And it it's very easy to look back and be like, oh my God, how do we watch that? Or how is that my favorite movie or this or that? Um, but just understanding there's going to be that kind of like reconciling of the past right. with the present. So is there any movie that you used to like back in the nineties <laughs> that now you're like, mm, well, it, what it was, what it was. Um, we have a lot of those. So one of the yes. concepts on our show is that we rate the show in the beginning of the episode where we say, um, what did our Y2K selves think of it? And then after we go through the movie, we say, okay, what do we think now? Because there, there's a lot of times when there's such a difference. Um, and sometimes the nostalgia wins over and we're like, we know it's horrible for this time. It didn't age well, but don't care. Love it. That was Camp what? Hardly Wait for me. I was like, I would still buy this movie. I don't, I understand it's problematic. <clears throat> I understand everything. I will still watch it any chance I get. I had a visceral reaction to B Billy Madison when we did it. Mm -hmm. So Jackie and her sister did that episode with, like, Jackie's sister did that episode with us, and they had, like, a very specific childhood nostalgia for it. And I used to love that movie, but when I rewatched it, I was like, this is bad. <laughs> like, I, there, I didn't find many redeemable things about that movie, and that was really hard because they loved it so much, and I was like, uh, y'all, this is bad. I think the worst one we have encountered 
is heavyweights to the point where Danielle <gasps> called me like five minutes in and was like, I don't think I can watch this movie. And I'm like, you know what? We, we owe it to our audience to do it so we can discuss how disgusting and problematic this movie is. It, it we, was, it was horrible. We also didn't have nostalgia tied to it. That was no. not a movie that both of us watched a lot. And I think the, a lot of people who are obsessed with that movie, it's the nostalgia for mm -hmm. them. Right. Yeah. It definitely depends on if you had a relationship to something when you were younger versus not. Mm -hmm. Are there any movies that are from the 90s that you actually have never seen that you would want to see for the first time now? Oh, you know, there, there are a few, like, little ones that like indie films that I'm like how did we miss this um I'm trying to think of what their names are that's the other hard part let, let me pull uh, up my, I have to pull up our spreadsheet to see <laughs> oh I think the movie is nowhere there's like um it's definitely a gen x movie is it nowhere or nobody I think it's nowhere it's nowhere um I've never seen that one there's a lot of scary movies I've never seen, so I've never seen Saw. I'm not saying I'm dying to see it, um, but it is a, a hole in your. It is there. Viewing. It is a hole in my resume for sure. Yeah, you know but that's two thousands. You know what's funny is I actually did see Saw through Saw Five in 2008 when Saw Five came out. Oh, we wow. had a whole. I was marathon. in college and we had a whole marathon and I have no idea why because <laughs> I guess at that time I could just handle a lot. Now I don't have the heart for it. And also when I was a child, I talked about this a few episodes ago with someone how I was literally terrified of everything as a child. And when I would go to the movie theater and they would have giant horror movie posters, I would like start crying if I looked at it. There's one movie in particular, which I'll have to tell you. I refuse to say it on the air because I okay. know someone will send me a picture of it and ruin my life and re-traumatize me. Oh, no. But even like going to Blockbuster, I had to go literally shield my face away from the horror section because I had a visceral reaction to seeing horror movie covers it wasn't just like oh that's scary or I'm not interested yeah um it was genuinely terrifying and then as I got a little bit older I kind of lost interest in the psychological thriller as yeah. well I'm like well if it's more realistic it makes you thinking and then I'm like mm, I'm psychologically thrilled enough thank you <laughs> <laughs> Jackie did you think of any so I have hard opinions on um different actors so I, I don't watch any Tom Cruise movies. I just, I, I don't care for him. And then Russell Crowe, I watched his movies up until, so that is a blind spot because I've never seen Gladiator. I've never seen 300, or, well, 300 wasn't, but I've definitely never seen Gladiator. And it's because Russell Crowe talks so softly. I feel like I have to crank up the volume and then everyone else is screaming and I just don't have patience for that. But now that I... <laughs> Now that the captions help me here, then maybe I can revisit that now. <laughs> yeah. I would be like that too, where you turn it all the way up and then something scary happens or there's like a and then yeah. I'm like, now I'm terrified and scared and yeah. I blew my own eardrums out. The movie that I remember was like, I, I'm done with Russell Crowe was uh, Proof of Life because it was him like mumbling and then. Um, Meg Ryan, was Meg Ryan one. screeching the whole time, and I was just like, "I'm, I'm done with this situation." So definitely, Gladiator is a blind spot. I've never seen it. Well, we did the sweetest thing, and I think so many people like sleep on that movie. But we found like so a lot of people love that movie too. I don't know if you've seen that one. That one is definitely in that. It took a, a spin off, yeah, like a raunchy, raunchy comedy, com but it for is, women, yeah. It's from a female perspective, which we super appreciated because we didn't get a whole lot of that in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but yeah, I'm real nervous to do like American Pie and like Van Wilder because I loved those movies, but I feel like I'm going to watch them and be like, what was I 
thinking. I did recently rewatch The Sweetest Thing. That was one I had on DVD. I have seen that movie many times. And the most recent time, it's one of those, like how we were talking about before, because I have nostalgia tied to mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. That was a movie that I would watch with my college friends. And we would all laugh and we'd be like, I'm Christina and you're, you know, and but if I saw it for the first time now, I would be like, hmm, okay, interesting. <laughs> Very interesting movie. Thank you guys so much for being Absolutely. here with me today. Tell everybody where they can find you and listen to your podcast. Well, you can check us out on social at No More Late Fees. We are on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and YouTube. It's always at No More Late Fees. Um, and we are on Apple, Spotify, pretty much everything. If you go to one of our social um, accounts, we have a link in there with all of our the ways that you can listen to us. So check it out. And we hope that you can come and join us for an episode and um, have some fun with us on our app, on our show. <laughs> Would love to. And thank you everyone for listening. We will see you soon. Bye guys. Bye. That's a wrap for this week. If you like Nostalgia, please connect with me on social. Subscribe to the Nostalgia newsletter at nostalgia.substack.com and follow, rate, review on your platform of choice. Everything's linked in the show notes, including where to find more about our guest of the week. Thank you so, so much for your support. And that was this week's episode of Nostalgia. Nostalgia.